Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully my the volume is adequate and you're able to hear me clearly. Thank you again for taking time to be with us. Mention now that uh, I will not be able to be with you this Lord's Day, but next Wednesday evening, again in the will of the Lord, same time, we'll be able to take up the next church that we come to in the book of Revelation, the church, of course, at Pergamos, Pergamos and consider that. But this evening, we're looking at the church at Smyrna, and we'll read from Revelation 2 and verse number 8. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and last, which was dead and is alive. I know. Now, most renderings, if you're reading from the ESV, the NASB, or even Mr. Darby, they omit the word works. I know thy tribulation, poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of the, those things which shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And we are confident that God will add blessing to the public reading of his very precious word. Smyrna was about 35 miles north of Ephesus, the church we looked at last week. It was famous from the standpoint that in 600 BC, it had been destroyed. And even closer to the time of writing, an earthquake had destroyed the city. And on both occasions, the city had been rebuilt. In fact, it became known as the city which had died and came to life. You can see the link then with the way the Lord Jesus presents himself to the assembly. Church at Smyrna, the letter to the church at Smyrna is actually the, the shortest of all the letters. And maybe there's a lesson there that is for our benefit. If we're thinking of giving comfort, as the Lord is giving comfort here to a suffering church, when trying to comfort, maybe brevity is a very wise approach. You recall the lengthy diatribes of Job's friends, which were in the end called iniquity by the Lord, and they had not spoken the thing that was right. So at times, silence or brevity is really the best way of being a comfort or being a help to believers who are suffering. If we're linking Smyrna with the Old Testament, of course, your mind would go to Exodus and the furnace of affliction, a very defined period God had given of how long they would be in servitude to the Egyptians. And of course, even there, God revealed himself to Moses as the I am. And here again, God, the Lord Jesus reveals himself as the I am. I am the first and last and he that was dead and is alive. So there are some links then with the book of Exodus in its character and so on. What we're going to be looking at here is really the divine divine refiner and the furnace of affliction. While it's the shortest letter, yet it's rich in truth, and a number of lines of truth will be traced through it as we go down it together. We'll see something of the sovereignty of God. It stamps itself very clearly upon the defined period and the limitations of satanic attack. So there is the sovereignty of God. There is the suffering of saints, which is what we're looking at, especially in the letter here to the church. Here is a church going through suffering. We'll talk about why that was so and where the opposition was coming from and why the suffering was being permitted. The suffering of saints. We'll see the strategy of Satan as well and how he operates and what he does. We'll see something of the spiritual assessment by heaven, the total reversal of everything that men would judge. Men would view them as very poor. God viewed them as being very, very rich. So we have that. We have as well the similarity to the church at Philadelphia. We'll notice that as well there, in the church at Philadelphia, there is a door, there is a trial, there is a crown, there is the synagogue of Satan. So we'll notice a number of similarities with the church in Philadelphia. So this is church number two. Philadelphia is church number six. We mentioned the correspondence of one and seven, two and six, three and five. We'll notice those as we go through these 
others together. And then just to mention the significance of the name Smyrna or myrrh. It means myrrh, as you know, and it's the idea of fragrance linked with suffering. Interesting to think that the Lord Jesus was the recipient of myrrh on three occasions. Recall at his birth, wise men came with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Amazing to think that they brought what was for burial at his birth. Of course, Joseph and Nicodemus brought it. Nicodemus especially likely brought the myrrh and aloes, 600-pound weight, at his burial. And on the cross, evil men offered him wine mingled with myrrh, which he did not receive. So myrrh was linked with the life of the Lord Jesus and with his humility, with his suffering, and with his burial. We'll notice all of that. But I want to come then and look at these verses in more detail and, and more particularly. I want you to think, first of all, of the refiner and his ability. We'll see something of his skill, something of his sympathy, and something of his sovereignty. As far as his skill, you'll notice how he introduces himself here. These things say at the first and the last. This is the one who not only knows the future, but who controls it. Here were people undergoing circumstances of tremendous, tremendous difficulty, tremendous suffering, opposition. It meant for many of them loss of jobs, loss of livelihoods. It meant even for many loss of life. So there were circumstances that were very, very adverse. And of course, when those kinds of things happen, we always ask ourselves, why? But here we are reminded of the one who was the first and the last. He's able to control every circumstance. He controls it. He conceives it. And as the last, he completes it. He brings everything to its purpose, everything to its end. A very useful study would be to consider these the three occasions in Isaiah's prophecy where he uses this expression, the first and the last. He uses it in Isaiah 41, Isaiah 44, Isaiah 48. He uses it in connection with the raising up of Cyrus, likely 170 or more years before Cyrus the Mede rose to power. God identifies him through Isaiah. He uses it for the restoration of Israel in the future. He uses it as well for the Babylonish captivity and the return from Babylon in the future. So in Isaiah, he is using it relative to the past and to the future. He is the God who is before all things and the God who is after all things. He is the one who is always on time, knows the end from the beginning. Governments, powers, potentates come and go. But thankfully, our God remains. If we want to put it in New Testament language, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. No change Jehovah knows. So he is first and last as to his deity. But then when we see this expression that we have in verse number uh, eight, which was dead and is alive, or more literally, who was dead and who came to life, we are reminded of his humanity. So we have a reminder of both his deity and his humanity in these expressions. The one who was dead and became alive is therefore not ignorant, indifferent, or insensitive to their suffering. He has been through the very worst that men could heap upon him. He has gone into death, and he has come out victorious. As a great high priest, he is able to meet every need. You recall the high priest carried the stones upon his shoulders. Two stones, six names engraven on each upon his shoulders, the place of strength, the place of security. But... On his breastplate, each tribe was inscribed with its own unique special stone. Each one was near to his heart. I can understand Judah being there, perhaps Benjamin, but can you imagine that he has Dan, a stone engraved, engraved with the name of Dan upon his breastplate? He has the names of other tribes that would fail, Ephraim and Reuben and so on, tribes that never gave him much in the way of glory or honor. And yet he has all of those names individually inscribed and carried upon his breast as a sign of his affection, of his love, and of his care for each and every one. You will notice as well here that we are told that the Lord is seen here in his sovereignty. 
Now we're looking at, for that down at verse number further down the chapter at verse number um, ten, 10 it is, be tried for 10 days. He knew the exact length of the trial through which they were going to pass. He had marked off its limitations. He had defined its period thus far and no further. Men could do certain things to a point, but then divine sovereignty would bring it to a halt and the trial would be over. Peter reminds us, among other things, that trials are for a reason and for a season. And the season of trial here was 10 days, likely literal. Some have likened this to the 10-year persecution under, under some of the emperors, the Roman emperors, Diocletian and others. But the key thing to take away is whether 10 days, 10 years, however we want to appreciate it, it is limited and defined and controlled by the Lord himself. The Lord controls the character of trial and the duration. Someone has said that he keeps his eye upon the thermostat, the therm thermometer, and his hand upon the thermostat. He regulates things. He knows what we're able to bear. And his goal is to bring us forth as gold tried in the fire, to make us better, to make us pure, more better Christians. We'll notice some of the reasons for trial in a few moments, but just we want to keep this in mind. And we want to also mention both Peter and James in their discussions on trial and their encouragement to us, remind us that every trial is a trial of our faith. Now, that does not mean my faith in Christ, but really what it means more than anything else is my faith in God. I don't know about you, but if I'm stuck in traffic and I have a, an appointment to get to or a meeting to get to, and I am being held up, one of the first things that comes to my mind is, doesn't God know I need to get there? Or if you have a flat tire and you need to get somewhere, doesn't God know? Why did he allow this? That's really testing my faith, my confidence in God's character. Does he know? Does he care? Does he love? All of those questions flood our mind when negative things occur into our lives. It is a test of my faith. And we are reminded that the man who was able to pass the test and become approved receives a crown of life. So it's unfortunately normal for us when going through trials of various natures, some of them very, very minor compared to what we're looking at here in the church at Smyrna, some very, very minor insignificant trials. The first thing that comes to our mind is, does God know? Does God care? Does God love? Is God in control? And we're reminded here that trials test our confidence in God, in his character, in his knowledge, in his goodness. And maybe there's someone listening and you're going through a trial, not the persecution and risk of death that these believers are going through, but going through a personal trial with health, with family, some other sphere. And your mind at times has been attacked by thoughts of, of is God really in control? Does God care? Does he know? This letter, this short letter to the church at Smyrna reminds us of one who has gone through the furnace of affliction himself. He has gone through the fires of Calvary. He knows what trial is like. And we are reminded that he, he cares. Just think of the life of Joseph back in the book of Genesis. How often it says, but the Lord was with him and the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Very vital to remember that as we pass through the fire, I with thee, and through the floods, they will not overflow thee. He is with us in all of our trials, all of our difficulties. The psalmist in Psalm number 23, it's often been remarked, and I may be repeating what you know so well. He speaks about the shepherd in the first three verses. But as he, as he enters the valley of the shadow of death, he now speaks to the shepherd. Thou art with me. Thy rod. So in the in the valley of difficulty is where he got to know the shepherd in a very intimate way. And likewise, we get to know the shepherd in intimacy as we pass through times of, of trial and times of difficulty. It perhaps is helpful also if we view these churches as progressive, meaning Smyrna is because of what occurs in Ephesus and Pergamus is what occur what is what is the outgrowth of Smyrna. If that's the case, then remember the church at Ephesus had left their first love. 
and perhaps the fires of affliction here that are trying the assembly at Smyrna are all for the purpose of restoring them to their first love. So the suffer the refiner and his ability. Let me take a few minutes to talk to you about the furnace and its intensity. I want you to think of the of the place, of the persons, of the pressure that these believers were under. Smyrna. We mentioned already the background of the city, destroyed twice, rebuilt and came to life twice. A very wealthy city, really almost rivaling Ephesus for its wealth. A city that was marked by devotion to Rome and the worship of Caesar, very definitely. In fact, every year, everyone had to make an offering, a pinch of incense, and declare Caesar is Lord. And of course, that is where the problem came for the believers. It was likely just a statement of political allegiance, but many viewed it as being blasphemy and rivaling their Lord in heaven as to their affection and as to their devotion and their allegiance. So many refused to own Caesar as Lord. Among them, you're probably familiar, those of you who have read church history, with the martyr Polycarp, who in his 90s was taken out to the stake and burned to death for failing to give allegiance to the Caesar of his day. So the fanatical devotion to Rome was what marked one of the things that marked the city. Secondly, the um, patron goddess of Smyrna was Cybele, who in their mythology died every winter and came to life every spring. And again, we have the death and resurrection motif that reminds us of how the Lord presents himself as the one who died and who came to life again. So we had that. We had also at Smyrna the, a large number of temples which ring the city. It was known as the crown of Ionia. The temples ring the city literally, and it was a city given over to temple worship, with the most worship being given, of course, to, to Caesar. <coughs> Who then were the people that were responsible for their persecution? Well, obviously, the Jews did not have the authority to put people to death. They were in a Smyrna as a um, people under the control of Rome. Rome was the only one that had the, had the power to and the authority to put to death. But nevertheless, the Jews and Gentiles combined in their persecution, and likely the Jews raised false accusations and the Gentiles carried out the persecution. But the persecution was primarily because of a failure to worship and own Caesar as Lord. I mentioned the ramifications of that. If you did not own Caesar as Lord, you did not get your certificate. If you didn't get your certificate as a good citizen, you likely would not be able to get a job. So at, for, at the very least, you would be out of work. At the worst, You'd be subject to death as a traitor and as someone who would not recognize the authority of Caesar in your life. So persecution, imprisonments, deprival of jobs, death itself, all of that was the result of the persecution they were enduring, the character of the persecution they were enduring. Then, of course, we're reminded that behind it all was Satan. Those who were involved in the persecution, the Jews, were the synagogue of Satan. And then we are reminded of the devil, the adversary, the false accuser, casting some of you into prison that you may be tried. So behind all of this political and religious persecution was a power, was a sinister evil, and he was stoking the fires of persecution, intensifying the furnace of affliction for these believers here in Smyrna. He operates in many different ways. Here he operates by the fires of affliction. When we come to the next, this next church, Pergamus, he'll appear as a friend. When we come to Thyatira, he is a false teacher, an angel of light. He is mentioned for the fourth time in the letter to Philadelphia. So he is the foe of everything that brings pleasure to God. So we see him in all of these different ways. You'll notice here he is referred to as the devil. Elsewhere, he is Satan. Just a suggestion, not a hard and fast one. As the devil, he opposes God's people 
by false accusation. As Satan, he opposes God's purposes. So he, he is contrary to the people of God. He is opposing the purposes of God. And here he is doing it through persecution. So the place, Smyrna, with all of its background, the people involved, the Jews and Gentiles together, the synagogue of Satan, and then the Satan himself, the devil, and his uh, casting them into prison and so on. What about the pressures they were enduring? Well, there was, first of all, poverty. Now, you'll notice, and I mentioned in my opening remarks, the Lord does not mention, I know thy works. He'll do this in all the other churches. But here was a church that was so oppressed, so persecuted, that as far as works for God, likely they were not able, they did not have the opportunity to do any works for God because of their suffering, their imprisonment, and so on. So we are reminded here, that they were under a great stress because of persecution. Likely they were boycotted. They couldn't belong to the guilds, the work unions. And Smyrna was for them really a very, very difficult place, despite it being a very wealthy city. For Christ's sake, they had become poor. That is the same word used of the Lord Jesus in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, who for your sakes became poor. But God's assessment is that they were rich. They had endured as well the, the blasphemy. We're reminded of that in this short letter. Now, the blasphemy that they have endured um, in verse number nine, the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, it may have been blasphemy against the Lord, or it may have been blasphemy against the believers. Either way, it is very, very grieving to hear blasphemy against Christ, and very grievous as well to endure blasphemy from friends, family, and, and neighbors. The name, the, the blaspheming the name of Christ really is another way in which we suffer in a world of sin, in a world that has become so defiled and so anti-God. I've often thought of the Lord Jesus moving through this world as a man of sorrows. He would have sorrowed over everything that was contrary to God, everything that was failing to honor God, everything that was hypocritical. He grieved over it all. And it just reminds me of how indifferent I have become to sin, how indifferent I have become to everything that brings grief to the heart of God. The Lord Jesus never became hardened, never became indifferent, but rather was always tender and sensitive. So there was the poverty. There was the blasphemy. There was the imprisonment we're reminded of here. Some of you people cast into prison, persecuted 10 days. Now, not all would go through the same persecution. You'll notice in verse number uh 10 shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried the way i like to express it is the the trial of one in an assembly becomes the test of everyone of all so the trial of one becomes the test of all what i mean by that is it will test how we respond to the believer who is going through a trial do we avoid them because we don't know what to say do we sit back self-righteously and say well Likely it's some sin in their life and something that God is chasing them for. Or do we seek to support them in any way that we can with comfort, with prayer, with encouragement? Everyone is tested when someone goes through a trial. Everyone displays a lack of love or an abundance of love one for another. Trials are difficult for the people of God. Trials are unfortunately common for the people of God. And so we are all tested when a believer in the assembly goes through a trial. And the great thing is, how do we respond? What do we do? There was poverty. There was blasphemy. There was imprisonment. For some, there was death. Some would pay the ultimate price, call to faithfulness to all the way to the point of death. Obedient unto death, as the Lord Jesus was, even for him, across death. He was faithful unto the point of death. Let me then just digress for a moment, not really digress, but really take up the major theme that is present in this letter, and that is the suffering of believers. Why do believers go through trial? Why do believers suffer? In fact, we could rephrase it and say, why do some of the choicest, the saintliest believers suffer? We often thought it was Abraham and not Lot 
who was called upon to take a child up to Mount Moriah. It was Joseph and not Reuben who knew what it was to endure slavery and the chains in the prison and the dungeon. It was David, the man after God's own heart, who knew what it was to endure the javelin, the nights and the cold and in the fields of Engedi and in the caves. So some of God's choicest saints have gone through the most difficult of trials. So why then do believers suffer? I can give you at least four or five reasons that appear in the word of God, recognizing at the same time, there likely are others that you could add to this list. Some believers suffer punitively, meaning they, are, they have sowed seeds of sin and they are reaping the fruit of what they have sown. When you think of that, you automatically think of dear Jacob. Now, please, let me say at the very outset, Jacob is my hero. I would love, love to be able to finish life like Jacob. I think he went out in a blaze of glory. He went out in one of the most wonderful ways possible, giving fresh revelations of Christ. If you look at Genesis 49, he gives at least five fresh revelations of Christ that were not given up to that point in time, the stone, the shepherd, the Shiloh, and so the star, all of these things, all revelations he gives of the coming Messiah. He goes out in a blaze of glory. But having said that, you recall some of Jacob's devious ways early in life. Jacob had deceived his father with a coat of skins. How did his sons deceive him about the death of Joseph? They did so with a coat, again, deceiving him. You recall that Jacob deceived his father because his father's eyes were blind, couldn't see, dim. How did Laban deceive Jacob as to a wife? It was in the dark. Jacob took the firstborn, the birthright, by craft, by deceit. Likewise, Laban, more deceitful than, Joseph, that, than Jacob, he made sure that the firstborn was married first, so that in the dark, Jacob got Leah and not Rachel. And you go through Jacob's life and notice wherever he had done something deceitfully, had done something underhandedly, later in life, somehow he reaped that from the hand of God. So there was punitive trial for Jacob, punitive suffering in his life. But now, having said that, I think we can say that should be the rare occurrence in every believer's life. Rare. So I am never, never to sit in judgment on another believer and say they are receiving that chastening from the hand of God because of what they did. Leave that with the Lord. Never, never try to interpret another believer's suffering. So punitive suffering. Then there is preventative suffering. You recall the Apostle Paul. Because of the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a messenger of Satan, the thorn in the flesh, lest I should be exalted above measure. So God sent chastening to Paul to prevent him becoming too proud. It's amazing to think that even the apostle Paul was subject to pride. All of us know the difficulty it is dealing with ourselves and our, our pride. And the Apostle Paul had a messenger of Satan to buffet him, to prevent him from becoming too proud and as a result becoming ineffective in his service for God. So the wonder of it all is in God's matchless wisdom and ways, he allows Satan to buffet Paul so that Paul can be more useful in his service in overthrowing the kingdom of Satan. What a wonderful God we have who is so wise, so kind, and so lovely in all of his ways. So punitively, to prevent us from failure, from sin, he allows it also to purify, to purify us. And so many times you see believers going through trial. We have it in the word of God, examples of those who are being purified by the suffering and by the difficulty they are undergoing. You think of Peter, you think of others in the word of God who were purified. Even Job speaks of coming forth as gold so that he was purified. He was a perfect man, and yet he could get to know God better and could be purified by the fires of affliction. Then there's suffering that is preparatory. I've already mentioned the life of Joseph. 
How was God going to take a shepherd boy who kept sheep and make him second ruler in the kingdom of Egypt, this vast empire that was mighty and powerful in his day? Well, he taught him administration in Potiphar's house. Then he taught him administration in the prison. And finally, when he is ready, God promotes him to the second throne in the kingdom. He was being prepared for service. Likewise, David in his suffering was being prepared. You think of others in the word of God who went through times of trial and difficulty and were prepared by God. Finally, there's a sense in which at times <coughs> God allows suffering to reveal himself to us in deeper ways. Whenever I think of that, I think of Jeremiah. There is hardly a prophet in the Old Testament who knew the grief, sadness, loneliness of Jeremiah. I know that God has his ways, but I've often felt so sorry for Jeremiah. God told him he was not allowed to marry. I would love to think of Jeremiah going home at the end of a day and after all the abuse and all of the ridicule and all of the mockery he endured, being able to go home to a wife and unburden his heart. But Jeremiah wasn't permitted that. He did have a friend. He had actually two converts, Ebed, Melech, and Barak. The only two converts we know that he had in his over many, many, I think it's over 50 years of ministry, just two converts. He knew God in a fresh and in a better way. And he becomes a very lovely picture of Christ in his sufferings, in his loneliness, in his sorrow, in his tragedy, becomes a picture of Christ for us. So we're reminded that believers going through trial may well take on characteristics of Christ. John 15, the branch abiding in the vine, the father with the pruning knife, we're reminded that the fruit that is born is likeness to Christ. That's the fruit of John 15, becoming like the Lord Jesus. And the father holds the pruning knife and allows trials and refinement to come to make us want to be and to become more like his son, whom he delights to see in each one of us. Then there are times as well when God allows trial to reveal himself to the world. He did that with Daniel. He did that with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He had to own the greatness of the God that could preserve them, whether in the lion's den or in the furnace, fiery furnace. And so God sometimes allows believers to go through trial to reveal his greatness to others. We've probably all known believers who have gone through tremendous trial, things that we think as we look, sit on, sit back and look on. I don't know how I would ever be able to endure that. And yet God has ministered grace to them and they've gone through the trial, not only gone through it, but they have grown through it and they become blessed by it. Having said that, <laughs> You'll forgive the uh, humor, but I've thought there's three ways you can go through a trial. You can groan through it, you can go through it, or you can grow through it. God wants us not to groan through trials, and not merely to go through trials, but to grow through our trials. And God has allowed believers to go through trials for their growth, but also as well at times to reveal himself and his greatness so as we've looked upon believers who have gone through what we would consider insufferable trials, we've looked on and marveled at the grace of God that has sustained them. And it has revealed to us something of God's wonderful ways and his grace. So those are just some of the reasons for trials that come into a believer's life. Come with me then and think for a moment of the material and its quality. This, the assembly and the quality of the assembly and its character. First of all, you notice the absence of any word of correction. Two assemblies who do not receive any word of correction, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Now, does that mean Smyrna was perfect? Or might it mean, on the other hand, that God never says anything negative about his people when they are suffering. Or to put it in another way, if I can, God always says the best he can about his people when the world is saying it's worst. 
So here the world was blaspheming them. God is going to praise them. God is going to honor them. We'll have the same in Philadelphia. No condemnation, no criticism, no correction, but just praise and delight and honor that he gives. You remember that when Israel was in the wilderness and Balaam sought to curse the people of God, he couldn't. Now, it's very likely if we compare accounts and understand some of what Moses was saying later, it's very likely that Israel was not in a great spiritual condition as they camped in the plains of Moab and uh, Balaam tried to curse them. But because he was trying to say his worst, God made him say the very best he could about the nation. In keeping with that, it's very interesting and encouraging to me, very encouraging. When you come to the New Testament, God never brings up the failure of an Old Testament saint. You recall the wonderful pronouncement in the book of Hebrews, their sins and iniquities, will I remember no more forever. So someone like Jonah, despite his failure, is presented to us in the Gospels as a picture of Christ in death, burial, and resurrection. Lot is given high marks. Even some of the less prominent are spoken of, and their failures are never, never brought up. Solomon as well, nothing of his failure, only that which is noteworthy. Noah, despite his drunkenness at the end of his life, spoken of in glowing terms. And so we see that God speaks well of Old Testament saints in the New Testament. And so we are reminded that God does not dwell on our sins and our failures. Maybe there's someone listening and you are paralyzed by, by your past. You feel you can't overcome the failure, the shortcomings of the past. Let me assure you, failure is never final with God. There is always a path of recovery, restoration, and usefulness. So please remember that we have a God of restoration, a God who does not dwell on our failures and problems. So first of all, there was the absence of, of correction. There was an appreciation for their poverty. Thou art rich. Riches lay in their spiritual wealth. We can have an insight as to what this means to the Lord. He wanted them to be richer and become even richer through suffering. And so he says they're rich, but he is putting them through this furnace of affliction that they might even be richer. I'll just mention this, and you can notice that as you go through each of the letters, each of the letters, there is a contrast. You recall that Laodicea, hot or cold. Here it's rich or poor. We come to some of the other letters that we'll look at. It's love and hate. It's holding my name and holding the doctrine, a name to live and yet dead, an open door and a shut door. So in every in each of the letters, there's, there's something contrasted here. It's poverty and riches. Poverty as far as material things, riches as far as spiritual things. That is what he appreciated about them. Not only that, but there was an awareness of what they were enduring. He knew exactly what they were passing through. He knew their tribulation, their trial. The omniscient one not only knew it because he's omniscient, but he knew it because he had experienced it himself. And that is helpful to remember. He is our great high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, was in all points tempted like as we, sin apart. And in principle, he has passed through every trial we could pass through. He knew a family that did not appreciate him. He knew kinsfolk who thought he was out of his mind. He thought his brothers thought he was foolish and full of folly for not going up to Jerusalem. He was called a blasphemer. He was called a sinner. He was called a one who was perverting the people. He knew all of these things, and so he could appreciate and evaluate and know something of their particular trial. He gave his approval to what they were enduring. Some cast in the prison, they would be tried. Some tried by the prison ordeal. Everyone being in the, everyone in the assembly being tried. And he mentions here that, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Here was his mark of approval for the trial they were enduring. You recall a similar statement that James makes in James chapter 1 when he speaks about trial. He says the man who goes through trial and is approved by God will receive a crown of life. I've often wondered, is that crown of life a literal crown 
Or is it that they have really learned the whole secret of life? That is being faithful to the Lord and knowing and honoring him. I don't think I'd make a big doctrinal argument over which it is. I think both are true. And so we have that here. And you notice how the Lord appears to this church. In almost every church after this, the Lord is going to suggest something about his garments, his offices, his ministry to them. But here it is just himself. He just presents himself. I am the first and the last, the living one who be the, the one who died, who now be, who now is alive. He's just presenting himself in his person. So in the end, we love his offices. We love all that surrounds him that sells of his glory and honors. But really, in the end, it is Christ himself who is the great blessing to his people in all of our trials, in all of our difficulties. We were just reading tonight in our assembly Bible reading in the upper room, John chapter 13. It was a very dark night for the disciples. It would be a darker night for Judas as he went out, but it was a dark night for the disciples. Their Lord was about to leave them. He was trying to prepare them for his absence. You recall there was one disciple who was resting on Jesus' breast. There was the place of safety, the place of security, the place of comfort in a dark night of trial. So we are reminded that in all of our trials, the very base, best place is to rest in him. Many of you being Canadians would not recognize the name of Jonathan Edwards. He was considered one of the great theologians back in the 1700s and involved in what was called the Great Awakening in North America. Jonathan Edwards was a theologian and a preacher, and he was nominated to become president of what would become Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. He left home. He had received a vaccination, experimental, mind you, against smallpox. He left home in, from Massachusetts and traveled to Princeton, New Jersey, but before he got there, he died from the vaccination. Now, I'm not getting involved in vaxing and non-vaxing. That's not what we're looking at here. Something much more deeper, sweeter. His wife got word in a letter that he had died. And she wrote to her daughter, and she said, a holy and a good God has covered us with a dark cloud. Oh, that we may kiss the rod and lay our hands upon our mouths. The Lord has done it. He has made us adore his goodness. That's resting in him amidst trials. Oh, that we might kiss the rod, the rod that has smitten, kissing the rod and adoring the name and the goodness of God. That's really the idea, isn't it, of enduring, being approved in the trial, seeing God in the trial and worshiping him. I'm not sure I have that grace. I would like to have it when the trial comes. So there is then the material and its quality. Just a final word about the finished product and its beauty. Satan wanted to destroy the assembly. The Lord wanted it to develop the assembly. That's the difference. Satan brings trials to destroy us. God brings trials to develop us and make us better believers. So they are tried. Ye may be tried. The refiner increases the value and beauty of the precious metal. And I mentioned already, Job says, when he has tried me, I will come forth as, as gold. I'd love to be gold for God, to be gold. They will receive the crown of life. Of course, death and life here are contrasted. They would receive death at the hands of men. They would receive the crown of life from the hand of, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ at the Bema, a crown of life. As I mentioned, I wondered if it's really the fact they've discovered the true meaning of life. Have they discovered the value of life to live for God? Whatever it may be, they have discovered and they have enjoyed something of the crown of life. There are many crowns in scripture, and there's the crown of the soul winner. There's the crown that's given to the one who suffers here. First Peter chapter 5 reminds us of the crown for the shepherds. We have the servant's crown that Paul speaks of. We have the crown of righteousness where God is going to vindicate his servant, Paul. He was being judged by an unrighteous judge. He was looking for the appearing of the righteous judge, 
who would give him a crown of righteousness in the coming day. And I would take it that is really a public vindication of Paul, who left this world under a cloud of suspicion, under the jurisdiction of Rome, but that God is going to vindicate his servant. But God is also going to vindicate his son. His son has yet to be vindicated fully before the eyes of men. But a day is coming when God is going to bring forth his son and he's going to crown him king of kings and lord of lords. So there are different crowns in scripture, all worthy of our study and meditation. And then, of course, the promise that is given, not hurt of the second death. So we're reminded here of likely a divine power, I'm sorry, a demonic power that is trying these believers, of a divine purpose in that trial that they might be tried and come forth as gold, a defined period, only 10 days, but then we have a distinct promise, not hurt of the second death. I think this helps us see in verse number 12 that the promises of the overcomer are promises made to all believers. All believers are overcomers. But here, living in the good of this, living in the good of this promise is what is going to enable them to endure the trial, knowing that whatever earth may inflict upon them, whatever men may inflict upon them, there will never be a second death, never be judgment in the lake of fire for them. Their life and their times and their future is all in the hands of the one who is the first and who is the last. It's always good to keep our eye on the future, on heaven and home. Back in the 50s, when I grew up, there was a woman named Florence Chadwick. She was the first woman to swim the English Channel, quite an accomplishment in its day. She wanted also to become the first woman to swim from an island called Catalina Island off the coast of California, to swim from Catalina Island all the way to the mainland of the U.S. to California. It was on a cold day in 1952, cold, cloudy, raw day that she jumped into the water off Catalina Island and began her swim. I think it's 25 or 26 miles. I'm not quite sure. You can Google it and check me later. She began her swim. She felt like giving up a number of times. She had a boat, of course, her mother and others in a boat following her, there for her protection and urging her on. Several times she wanted to leave the water, but her mother urged her and others urged her to just keep going, keep going. Finally, she was exhausted. It was cold, cloudy, misty. She asked, she begged to be taken out of the water. When she was taken out of the water, she realized she was only a half mile from shore. The next day at a press conference, as she gave her account of what happened, she told the reporters, if I just could have seen the shore, I would have kept going. I think sometimes we lose sight of the shore and feel like giving up. If we can just keep our eye on the shore, on heaven's shore, it will enable us to endure whatever trials come, whatever difficulties are encountered. And so this is the letter to the church at Smyrna, a persecuted church, and yet a church that was giving fragrance, delight to the heart of God. The myrrh was rising amidst their suffering, and it was coming as a fragrance to heaven. Here were people faithful all the way to the point of death. Few of us will be called upon to be faithful to death, but it would be wonderful if we could be marked by those who are faithful in whatever trials we have to endure, whatever period of life we have left to us, that we may honor the Lord Jesus Christ by being faithful to him. So with that, we'll just ask God's blessing and close in prayer. Thank you very much again for your attentiveness. Our Father, we bow before thee in the name of thy Son. We thank thee for all the resources there are in thy Son for believers enduring trial and difficulties. We thank thee that there is with thee abundant resources there is with thee abundant grace. And so we give thanks again for our Savior, thy Son, and thank thee again for all he endured for us and all he has passed through. We thank thee he will, his brow will be adorned not just by a crown of life, but he now wears the crown of glory and honor. He will wear the, the diadems of, of all the nations of the world in the coming day, owned as King of kings and Lord of lords. For him again we give thanks. We pray for thy people. We commend the assemblies listening to thee the different believers, the different families, and trust the word of God will be a strength and a help and an encouragement to them. We commend ourselves to thee now 
and give thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As mentioned earlier in the will of God, we'll be back again next Wednesday evening, again at uh, the same time, your 730, my 930. And we'll be looking together at the church at Pergamus, a much longer letter and uh, lots of things there to, to be corrected and lots of things there that were not in keeping with the mind of God at the time. So we'll look at that next week in the will of God. It helps if you read ahead and get a feel for the letter makes it a little easier to uh, not have to go into great detail and explanations. So until then, thank you very much again, and the Lord will see you in one week. Thank you.